I'm going to go through a little bit of the protocols. Um, our goal is keeping everyone safe and yet at the same time keeping us connected. All right, everybody. That's one of those boo-boos I was warning you about. Oh, for goodness sake. How's that? Okay? Good. Um, we still need volunteers to help us with ushering, uh, because for a couple of weeks anyway, it's going to be where we need you to be seated by someone so we have social distancing that's appropriate. Also, we're going to need some help from our at-home worshipers. Uh, and as soon as we start our live streaming, I will be telling you how that's going to work. Uh, some rules will be relaxed as we go forward, I do hope. Um, I suspect we will be able to do that. Uh, and in terms of volunteers, I know I'm asking for help when so many of you have been helping throughout our time apart. Um, and I'm just saying that this gives us all an opportunity to be a disciples of Christ. Uh, you know, churches have an 80-20 rule, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Uh, we've always managed to sort of avoid that, but we're slipping towards it. So if you're able to volunteer in any way with our Sunday morning worship, uh, I ask you to do so. Before we go much further, I need to thank. I need to thank all the musicians who've been coming in on Saturday mornings to share their gift of music with us. And I especially want to thank Susan Taylor for wrangling all those special artists and for coming in to sing with us. Thank you, Susan. Very special thanks to Marcia Soriano, who came in every single Saturday morning except one. Uh, and we are so grateful for your gift of music and for your willingness to be part of church, even as church was slightly changed for the past. So thank you. I want to thank all the technical people who made this possible. And all is really just two. Uh, Brendan Murphy, who's on the camera today, worked, took our re recordings to a whole new level when he joined us in November. Uh, Brendan not only brought a kind of fun and lightness to our Saturday morning gatherings, but he has donated a beautiful camera for us to use as well. Thank you, Brendan. And of course, thank you to Mr. Dean, who has tinkered and argued with our sound system since we stopped meeting in person. He's happily appeared in all of our kids' times and suffered through many a sleepless nights trying to figure out how to do what we're now actually doing. Thank you, Dean. <clears throat> and now, the moment I have been waiting for let us prepare to worship God. God of the resurrection, we gather this morning as a community of believers. We come with joy to greet one another and to hear again and again the amazing news 
Christ is risen. Love is victorious over death. You have given us new life in the name of your Son. May our singing and praying, listening and proclaiming be a testimony to the power of your love to transform us into a new creation, into a new community of faith. We pray this in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Now, as you probably surmised, we can't mingle and pass the peace, so we're going to do the passing of the peace a little bit different. This is the right side. No, I guess that would be confusing for you. This is the right side. This is the left side. The right side is going to say Christ is risen. The left side will say he is risen indeed. This side will say, peace be with you, and this side will say, also with you. Let's stand and face one another. And let's do it with enthusiasm. Look at Nancy. She got up all by herself. Okay? This side. All right, let's do that again, but we're going to do it with enthusiasm this time. Okay, here we go. There you go. Please be seated. Good. You may remain seated for the first hymn, uh, which is Christ is Alive. Generally speaking, we are going to let you sing through your masks, but we do ask that you not belt it out, Charlie Little. Uh, and. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> so let us sing, Christ is Alive. Christ is alive, let Christians sing. The cross stands empty to the sky. Let streets and homes with praises ring. Love drowned in death shall never die. Christ is alive, no longer bound to distant years in Palestine, but saving. Okay, from chapter 24 of the Gospel of Luke, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? And then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them 
who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. The women hadn't had the chance to prepare Jesus' body before he was laid in the tomb, to clean his wounds and anoint his body with sweet-smelling oils. So three days later, early in the morning, they go to the tomb, expecting to find a boulder blocking the way. Instead, they encounter an open entrance and no body within. There are two men in dazzling white clothing, angels most likely, reminding them that Jesus had told them he would rise from death after three days. They ask, why do you look for the living among the dead? Frightened, the women tell the disciples what they've seen. In Luke's version of the story, the men were nonplussed. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them, Luke writes. Only Peter runs to the tomb to see for himself that the body is gone. In the four gospel accounts of Jesus' life, none of the writers are interested in how the resurrection happened. Indeed, the entire event happens off stage and out of sight. And perhaps we should also set aside the question of how. What does interest them is that a change has taken place, not just in the risen body of Christ, but in the disciples as well. The women anticipated death, defeat, and a boulder blocking their way. Instead, their ending, the ending they expected gave way to God's plan for life, resurrection, and new beginnings. Tigers may not change their stripes, but contrary to popular thinking, people can and do change. They can be transformed by any number of circumstances or major life events, marriages or divorce, job changes, a pandemic, or an empty tomb. All have the necessary ingredients for transformation. That is, expectations thwarted, the rhythm of normalcy upended, and barriers to new beginnings removed. We're living through a complex moment in history. And if it were just the pandemic, it would still be a remarkable time. As we know all too well, though, it's much more. Aside from the millions of lives lost, the year 2020 challenged our expectations about the society in which we live. The murder of George Floyd, the catalyst for so much upheaval last summer, reveals cracks in our commitment to justice. The struggling economy has forced thousands upon thousands of people to wait in long lines at food banks, many for the first time. Children have essentially lost an entire year of school and all the social conditioning that goes along with it. Hyperpartisanship in Washington has reached an all-time high. And here we are in spring with its flowers and bunnies, and many of us, of course, see God most vividly in nature. But the virus is part of nature, too, and it is most certainly not beautiful. All of us, at some point in our lives, encounter seemingly immovable obstacles, unimaginable circumstances like the pandemic, overtake our lives, 
leading us to feel like we're slamming into a boulder over and over again that refuses to budge. But where others see insurmountable barriers impossible to move, I see the possibility of God's glory revealed in life-giving ways. I see the possibility of transformation. Transformation doesn't always happen, and it's certainly not always easy. We resist being transformed because what we know is somehow easier to deal with than what we don't know. Many of you have expressed a desire for a return to normalcy. You want to be with your family. You want to eat in a restaurant. You want to return to church. But can you, in all good conscience, Turn your eyes away from what you've seen in this past year. As we leave our tombs of quarantine, a return to normal would be a tragic missed opportunity. Can you roll the stone back and cover the tomb, pretending that all is as it should be? I, for one, hope not. My prayer is that we hold out for a new normal and that we allow ourselves to be transformed by what we've experienced as all the disciples were eventually transformed by what happened on that third day. Some of the new normal can be found in what we've learned about ourselves in the past year. I can really only speak for myself, but I know, because so many of you have told me, that you've discovered or rediscovered some lessons in our pandemic pause. Yes, my job has gotten harder. And yes, I am currently feeling the weight of significant family concerns. At the same time, though, I'm learning a new rhythm in my life, one that says it's okay for something to be put off until tomorrow. My to-do list every day is much shorter than it used to be. I'm reinvesting, my, I'm reinvesting in my long-distance friendships and family by taking advantage of the time I'm giving myself and by using the technology that allows me to see our daughter's sweet dimples. I've given myself permission to let go of at least some of my vanity. <laughs> and while it is indeed difficult to be with the same human being day after day after day after day, this time together, yes with my husband slash best friend has given me unimaginable joy. But is any of this transformation? Yes, all of it. Because for the first time in a long time, my priorities are right where they should be. For the first time since I was a child, I am discovering that it's the small things in life that truly matter. Mountaintop experiences come and go, but this moment, this place, this time is precious, filled as it is with so many small blessings worth acknowledging. Someone recently observed that I seem edgier, more easily rattled than I used to be, and that's probably true. I'm trying to reconcile my new normal with the old normal that really still wants to roll the stone back in front of the tomb, closing me off once again from the deeper, more meaningful life I'm discovering for myself. Easter is not and never was a return to normal. It is an upending of normal an invitation to be changed for the better. Jesus left his followers a world similar to ours, a world in need of compassion, forgiveness, and a commitment to justice. If we can remember the year from hell, 
as well as the empty tomb and all that Jesus has taught us and all that Jesus lived in his life, then perhaps we can hear the angels whisper to us, Jesus is risen. Transformation happens. Death does not have the last word, and God has so much in store for you. In one year, or five, or 10 years, how will you look back on 2020? Those who've lost loved ones may see it as a time of anguish. Those who have grumbled and resented their way through the year may end up seeing it as a void. I pray that you see it as a gift, as a lesson in learning to savor each precious moment in life and to see the world with new and grateful eyes. Amen. Towards the beginning of the pandemic, I found a poem that I vowed to read on our first day back together. Oops. <laughs> see, then you would have started on the wrong page. Towards the beginning of the pandemic, I found a poem that I vowed to read on our first day back together. Surprisingly, I did not lose it until this morning, uh, despite the fact that I've been working from two locations and despite the fact that my new normal has involved a major purge of paper. The poem is called When This Is Over by Laura Kelly Finucci. When this is over, May we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, full shelves at the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, Friday night out, the taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath. A boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be, we were called to be, we hoped to be. And may we stay that way, better for each other because of the worst. We are blessed with some beautiful music this morning from Susan Taylor, Kathy Smith, and Andrew Kent singing Glorious Day. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Calvary's mountain 
One day they nailed him to die on a tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. The hand that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him from rising again. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. trumpet will sound for his coming one day the skies with his glory will shine wonderful day my beloved one bringing my savior jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. Christ is risen. Thank you all. That was fantastic. I don't know why I have my phone. <laughs> Before we begin communion, I'm going to ask that when we're done, you hang on to this little cup and put it in the trash on your way out rather than sticking it in the pocket in front of you where we will never see it again until it has melted or petrified or something. Um, the Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. At your word, the earth was made and spun on its course among the planets. Your hand formed us from the dust of the earth and set us among all your creatures to love and serve you. When we were unfaithful, you kept faith with us, your love remaining steadfast. And when we were slaves in Egypt, you broke the bonds of our oppression, brought us through the sea to freedom, and made covenant to be our God. 
You spoke of love and justice in the prophets, and in the word made flesh, you lived among us, manifesting your glory. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to save us. He came with healing in his touch and was wounded for our sins. He came with mercy in his voice and was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and was met with violence and death. And by your power, he broke free from the prison of his tomb, and the one who was dead now lives. The one who humbled himself is raised to rule over all creation, the lamb upon the throne. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and shared it with his disciples, saying, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, remember. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, today we pray for our sisters and brothers in faith who are not here with us. But we lift to you our John Deering. We lift to you our Jim Alkire. We lift to you children on the border, children everywhere. As always, Lord, we ask that you be with those whose names we hold in our heart but have not spoken out loud those who point the way, who teach and preach, those who stand tall to protect us, so many right now protecting us, firefighters and EMTs and police officers, doctors, nurses, scientists, people giving vaccines, people helping us get vaccines, so many working so hard to keep us safe. We ask that you be with those who slip through the cracks in society, the last, the lost, the least, the left out. And finally, with great humility, we ask that you protect each and every one of us, that we may feel your presence and do your bidding in the world, gracious God. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we met bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. Nourished at this table, O oh God, may we know Christ's redemptive love and live a new life in him. Help us who recognize our Lord in the breaking of bread to see and serve him in all those lives that are broken. Give us who are fed at his hand grace to share our bread with the hungry and with the hungry of heart. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory and we feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. All glory and honor are yours, almighty God. Hear us now as we speak together the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is our communion cup. It has two openings. There's a clear plastic opening on the top, and under that, you will discover your little wafer. And then you eat your little wafer, the body of Christ. Oh, the best is yet to come. <laughs> then you peel back the other layer. And <clears throat> this is the cup of salvation. Oh, that's horrible. Okay, I promise by next month we'll have it all. It tastes like cough syrup, right? Okay, next month we'll have it all together and we'll won't need those. <laughs> it's horrible. Who says it's not bad? I've got a box of about 40 back there. You're welcome to take them home. <laughs> Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life now and forever. Amen. Our final hymn today is Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Um, let's stand. Thank you.
close this week as I will be working from home trying to prepare the next chunk of sermons. And the key word there is working from home, so please don't hesitate to call me if you need anything at all. I invite you, if you have not done so, to hang a prayer from our Shalom prayer meditation tree, but try to avoid clumping around the tree if possible. And as you leave the sanctuary, I invite you to consider giving to the mission and ministry of our church. Offering bowls are as we don't want to be passing cooties back and forth, um, but you can still give online and send in a check. And in advance of that, please join me as we pray over our offering. Gracious, loving God, we give thanks for these gifts, which will allow us to be your church, to serve your people, and be a beacon in the desert for all. Folks, our church never closed. It didn't. The building closed, but not the church, because we are the church. Human people near and far. People who believe in the teachings of Jesus. People who cherish the wonder of creation. Christians who believe in the powerful transformation possible when we encounter and meditate on the empty tomb. Allow yourself to be changed. Allow yourself to be more fully the person God would have you be. God bless you all for being here today, and may you be at peace until we meet again. Amen. Don't forget to come back next week. <laughs>